All right, praise God, you guys. Uh, last service and this service, we are continuing our study on the seven deadly sins. If you could turn, please, to Proverbs chapter 6 as we look at the seven deadly sins. And I'm excited about this series. Uh, hopefully, God's been doing a work in your heart uh, through this. In fact, uh, I just was really blessed. Uh, just 10 minutes ago, a sister came up to me and just shared about her son. And her son's younger than 10 years old. And she, she just blessed my heart because she shared that uh, he had heard the message on pride that we did. I did two messages on pride, which we began in chapter 6, verse 16, which says there are six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven, which are an abomination to him. The first thing on the list is haughty eyes or a proud look. And, and she said, you know what? He listened to that tape and she said, I noticed uh, his life was just transformed. There was transformation that took place in his heart. And she said, she asked him, what's God, you know, what's happened? She goes, you're being so humble and, you know, and what's going on? And she, he, just, he said, that, that message we listened to on pride, you know, that God just changed my heart. And he, uh, he goes, I'm trying to apply that to my life, you know. And I thought, wow, I think he's like, was a nine-year-old child, you know. And I, that just, I told her, that just makes my day, you know. Uh, if that can happen in the adults' lives, you know, Amen. And in the young people's lives, that's, that's an awesome thing. So uh, it's neat to hear the young people can hear the word, uh, an adult message, amen, and, and, and be convicted and seek to grow, amen. So uh, and I've told you before, take those messages and go through them with your children. That's one thing uh, that you could do. Sometimes we don't have time to prepare every week an a, a in-depth devotion for our children, but a lot of times you can take notes and go through those, some of those scriptures with your kids and it's good to always be praying and say, the Lord leads you to encourage your children. But one way to make it easy on you at times is to share the word of God that you learn here. And some of you like to bring your young, uh, young people in here. That's awesome. Uh, and I've you know, heard testimonies like that before. But that just happened just before the service. It blessed my heart. And I hope you'll avail yourselves of using the word of God, which is sharper than a two-edged sword, and transforms lives and see what God will do in the lives of your children. So we start with verse 16, where we had two messages where it says, there are six things which the Lord hates, and God does hate things. He, he hates evil, amen? He hates evil. And then he says in verse, uh, the end of verse 16, he says, yes, seven which are an abomination to him. There are six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. There are seven things that God deems as being abominable, just, you know, that just are revolting to his character, to his heart, to who he is. And uh, haughty eyes, pr- pride, arrogance. Uh, and we talked about that. Pride being that mentality uh, that elevates oneself above God and others, that uh, has an inflated view of self, that lives independently of God, that uh, considers oneself in a law unto themselves and what have you. And I mentioned that it's from that particular sin of pride that all these other sins that are mentioned in verses 16 uh, through 19 follow. It's the root of all evil. Pride is truly the root of all evil. And we talked about how the Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. It doesn't even say the love of money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of what? All kinds of evil. But pride is ultimately at the root of even the love of money. Because the love of money is what? A desire for power. You know, a desire to uh, put power and self and what you can do with that money above God, which is rooted in pride. You see, that's a, an action that's rooted in pride. So the first thing on the list after pride, the first sin mentioned, verse 17 says, haughty eyes. And then the next thing we see is a lying tongue, a tongue that lies. God hates a lying tongue. It's an abomination to him. If you have a tongue that speaks lies, it's abominable to God. That's pretty heavy when you think about it. You want to make sure that you do not have a lying tongue. And when we think of lying and we think of pride, we think of Satan as being the one who was first filled with pride. It says he was lifted up in pride and said he would exalt his uh, throne above the stars of God on the sides of the north, you know, uh, and... You know, where's the sides of the north? Well, we read in the book of Psalms about uh, Mount Zion, the, co- the congregation of Mount Zion, which is on the sides of the north. So Satan wanted to exalt himself above God's holy city, his holy people, his, his angelic assembly in heaven. 
And then even on the earth, Satan wants to take the temple of God where uh, the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God, the Apostle Paul wrote. And that's as close as Satan can get to being worshipped in the place of God is actually taking up residence in a rebuilt temple and deeming or, or seeking to be worshipped. And he even asked Jesus Christ to worship him. He said, bow down and worship me. And he showed him the kingdoms of the earth in Luke 4. He said, in a moment's time. It was like television before television as Satan tries to parade things before our eyes with, with the media and what have you. He was parading. It says in a moment's time, he showed Jesus everything that he could have. And it, Jesus, thank God, you know, rejected the temptation. Amen. But Satan was lifted up in pride and he manifested this pride to the human earth, to humanity, and sought to be worshipped and followed by humans. But how and what character or what what way did he deceive humanity? With lies. Jesus said he is the father of what? Lies. John 8, 44. He's the father of lies. And Jesus said he was a lie. He's a liar and he was a liar from the beginning. See, right there in the beginning with the first human beings, Adam and Eve, the first lies were, you know, half God said, he tried to get him to doubt God's word, which is truth. Jesus said in John 17, thy word is truth. He tried to get them to doubt God's word. And then he lied to them as he got them to get away from the truth of God's word. And he said to them, you can be, you know, God knows that when you eat, you know, you shall be as what? God. And he said, you shall what? Not surely die. You know, he lied, said, you'll be God. You won't really die. Which by the way, that lie has been repackaged in the occult and in the new spirituality and the new age movement all over the United States, most popular religion in Hollywood is the New Age movement, which teaches that you don't really die, you just keep coming back over and over again, you know, and we can be God, you know, the Shirley MacLaine New Age lie. So Satan's lies have just been repackaged. It's pretty amazing how that works. As believers, we have the truth of God's word, and we can see the deception going on. But Satan started the whole fall of the human race through lies. That's how damaging lies are. Lies are very destructive. We have a fallen, sinful nature that is prone to lying. And when you come forth from the womb, the Bible says that children come forth from the womb speaking lies. We have a fallen nature. And it's a result of the first lies from the pit, from Satan. The Bible says the tongue is set on fire from hell. And Satan used lies. In fact, think of the greatest and most heinous crime that was ever committed on this planet. Why was it committed? How, I mean, how was it pulled off? With lies? Jesus Christ was crucified by the hands of wicked men, it says. And it was a result of lies. You see, they falsely charged Jesus. They were trumped up charges stating that Jesus had claimed that he was going to destroy the temple in three days. Now, in John chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it up. And it says he spoke of the temple of his body. They took those words and they complained uh, to the Jewish leaders and Roman leaders that he said he was going to destroy the temple in three days. They twisted his words. And Jesus was crucified. But when Pilate crucified him, he put words up that were king of the Jews. In other words, he's claimed to be king of the Jews because they put your crimes up on the cross that you were dying for. And actually, Jesus was and is the king of the Jews. Amen? Jesus is the prophesied son of David who uh, was in line to be on, the king, on King David's throne. He was a prophesied Messiah uh, to come after the order of Melchizedek, according to the book of Psalms. And Melchizedek was the king priest. And, and he, the scriptures say in Daniel 9 that he would be crucified in the first century. Only Jesus fits that bill when you look at Isaiah 53 and, Psalm, and uh, Daniel chapter 9. And it even says he'd be rejected. We've gone through so much of Isaiah chapter 53. So he fulfilled that, and Pilate was moved to write king of the Jews, which was not a lie. It was a truth. But Jesus died for the very person he was from God's perspective because only he could ransom us, only he could save us from our sins. Amen? But it's interesting, when you look at the most heinous things in the world, they happen as a result of whether it's the fall of man, lies, or the most incredible crime that we've committed against God, crucifying God in the flesh, that was predicated upon lies. And lies will destroy your family. They'll destroy, if you're married, they'll destroy your marriage. Lies will destroy uh, a church if they're allowed to go uh, unchallenged or what have you, or there's people that aren't walking in righteousness. Lies are very, very serious. And God hates, doesn't just say he hates lies, it says he hates a lying tongue. 
Wouldn't that be a trip if you realize God hates your tongue? Just hates what your, your every movement is disgusting to God? If you are a liar, God hates your tongue. And if your heart is devising lies, He hates your heart. He hates my heart. Yeah, it says He hates a heart. Verse 18, a heart that devises wicked plans. That's the heart too. God doesn't just hate sin. He hates the source of those sins. He loves us. God so loved the world, yet he has come to hate what we have, what? Become. That's what the scriptures teach. Several scriptures teach that God hates the way we act and the things we do and the way we become. And he loves us so much that even though we become monsters in so many cases, the whole human race really has become monstrous before God. He loves us and wants to save us from what we become and are continuing to become in the case of those who aren't regenerated. And he gave his son to save us. He didn't send his son to condemn the world, Jesus said, but to save the world. The world might be saved through him. However, God demands repentance. He demands that we do a 180, that we turn and come to him and say, God, have mercy on me, and that we're sincere in our hearts. In fact, look at Proverbs chapter 10. It mentions uh, in verse 10, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 10, it says, He who winks the eye causes trouble, and a babbling fool will be ruined. And the context there, you know, every, uh, it's not talking about just winking. You know, someone says hi, and they, they, some people say hi, and they wink or whatever. But he's talking about those who wink deceptively. That they say they're going to do one thing, then they wink to somebody else, and, you know, because they've got a, pl- a plat or a plan that causes problems. Lying brings trouble. If you are an adult and you lie at work and you lie at home or you lie wherever, you're going to bring a lot of pain to your family, your workplace. You are going to bring a lot of agony. And as I give this message, Satan is going to whisper in your ear, tune him out. Don't listen. Just keep on lying because Satan wants to destroy you. Jesus said that the thief, Satan, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You need, if you have a struggle with lying at all, you need to make sure you are paying attention tonight, today because this may be the opportunity that God's given you to rescue you from the destruction that you will bring to your own household, uh, to your employment, to wherever you're at. This is a very, very serious subject. In fact, look at chapter 12 of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22. It says, Lying lips are what? An abomination to the Lord. But those who deal faithfully are his delight. So he doesn't just hate the tongue. He hates your lips if you're a liar. They are abominable to him. They are disgusting to him. doesn't matter how much lipstick you put on. And, well, guys too, unless you're a guy that wears lipstick. Then we've got to talk about a whole other message, you know, than lying, you know, God forbid. But, you know, uh, it doesn't matter what you do with your lips. They are an abomination to God if you are lying. And... The Bible says no liar or lie is of the truth. And in 1 John, it gives evidence of being born again. And one of those things is that you walk in the truth of God. And lying is a huge problem. And it's amazing to me the extent that people will go to when they lie and how they get in more and more trouble, you know. Mark Twain once said that if if you tell the truth all the time, you don't have to worry about remembering anything. Isn't that interesting? That old saying, you know, what a tangled web we weave when we seek to deceive. Uh, People that lie, they just get in more and more trouble. Their lives are hemmed in by just constant trouble. And the, the, the irony is that people lie because they think they're going to extricate themselves from trouble. I'll lie and get out of it, and they end up in more and more trouble. Isn't that amazing how that works? Just speak the truth. And you might have some kind of embarrassment or some kind of trouble because you speak the truth at a certain moment, but I can guarantee you, you'll have peace when you put your head on your pillow at night and things will clear up in the end. Or it's the opposite if you practice lying. Now, it's important for us to understand that it's a lot more work for people to lie ultimately. Did you know that? But people just go to great extents. You know, I read about this guy who you know, was pulled over for speeding. The cop, you know, the police officer pulls him over and the police officer says to him, you know, I clocked you at such and such a speed and, and I want to give you a driver's license, please. And, and he said, I don't have a uh, driver's license. He goes, you know, I, I, I lost it a couple years back uh, when I, they took it from me because of my fifth DUI. 
And he said, oh. He goes, okay, I'd like to see proof of ownership, you know. And uh, if you can get that. And he goes, I don't have that either. He goes, well, perhaps it's in your glove box. And he goes, well, I don't have proof of ownership. He goes, because, um, you know, this isn't my car. And I stole it. He goes, oh, you stole the car. He goes, oh. He goes, well, he goes, but well, I did see the proof of ownership, though, when I put my gun in the glove box. He goes, you put your gun in the glove box, huh? He goes, yeah. He goes, I saw, I saw the proof of ownership from some, someone else's proof of ownership in there. He goes, why would you have a gun in your glove box? He goes, because when I stole the car, I shot the lady in the head, and then I put it in the glove box. He goes, you shot a lady? He goes, yeah, she's in the trunk. Stuck her in the trunk. And the police officer's just like, I can't believe this. And he backs up, he draws his gun, he says, you know what, don't move. He calls, you know, for backup, he calls the captain. And before you know it, you've got like you know, eight or nine cop, eight or nine police officers surrounding this car, you know. And they've got their guns drawn. And, and uh, all of a sudden the captain says, okay, hey, I want you to, uh, and all of a sudden he says, here's my, my driver's license. And the captain takes it. He goes, well, I was told. And he goes, he goes, he has another police officer come over and he opens up the glove department and there's no gun there. And he goes, yeah, there's proof of ownership there. And he pulls it out in his car. And then they, they go and they go to his trunk and they pop open his trunk and there's no body there. And, and then the captain said, well, this police officer said that you stole this car and you don't have a license and there's a gun in your thing and you've got a body in the trunk. He goes, that liar. You know, he probably told you I was speeding too, huh? God, man. And I thought, when I read that story, I chuckled too. And I thought, the extent people go to to get out of things and I don't think that's a true story. I don't even know who made that up. It's a pretty crazy story. But uh, people go to incredible extents to lie, to get out of things. And they'll get other people in trouble in the meantime. And before you know it, you got chaos. And our country right now, I mean, we're in the midst of election. And as we go through this, we head toward this election, it's really hard for me personally to trust people. Personally, I don't know about you. You know, I mean, just think about what's going on with our economy. I mean, first OPEC, uh, you know... They shot the oil prices up, all the Muslim nations, and way up. And now all of a sudden they were able to lower again, just now. Way low. But they said they had to hire them. And and that helped put our country in turmoil. But not just what happened with the Muslim nations. It also happened because we have all kinds of corruption on Wall Street. And we have corruption in the government. And people taking, you know, favors and kickbacks and wanting lobbyists to support them. And so you have government leaders who are, are, are acting corruptly. You have uh, lenders who are getting incredible commissions for loans they, would never, they knew never would get paid back. And, and then you have all these uh, you know, community groups that are encouraging these loans and knowing a lot of them would be able to be paid back. And, it's just, and now the government's telling us, hey, we're bailing you out. And then part of me says, well, look at when they're bailing them out, they're rewarding a lot of these corrupt people. And... I just, I'm sorry, I can't. The Bible says, cursed is the one who puts his trust in man. And the Bible says, do not put your trust in princes. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, my servants would fight. Our trust needs to be in the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the way, he is the truth. He is the life, amen? And our trust needs to be in the Lord, amen? And it's amazing because you know what? It's funny because there's so many jokes around lawyers because lawyers has, being a lawyer comes to be synonymous in our day and age with being a liar, you know? And not every lawyer lies. That's a stereotype. There are, there are lawyers who seek to be truthful. But it, it's, uh, and politicians, I mean, politicians, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I go to these different websites and these, with the different political leaders and, and who are running this stuff, and I see campaign commercials on both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat, that are filled with half-truths and lies. On both sides, I'm sorry. It's truth. I can, it's documented. I've got documentation. These guys, it's, and it's amazing to me. And it just blows me away. And it's funny because most politicians, you know, are also lawyers, you know, so it's like it crosses over a bit, and, and there's that old, uh, that old joke about how do you know when a lawyer's lying? Anybody remember the answer? When their lips are moving. So, you know, and that's not always true, but why are there so many jokes about lawyers? Because we know there's a kernel of truth with a lot of lawyers, a lot of politicians, and it's quite sad, actually, when you, you think about it, and 
so forth. And, and uh, I read about uh, 13 politicians who were, you know, going through a uh, country area as they were campaigning together. And they were all excited, but they were just driving their truck, but they were just laughing, hee-hawing on how they were just fooling all these dumb country folk as they thought they were and, and what have you. And, and their bus hit a tree. And all 13 lawyers just got spread out throughout the, you know, the road. And this old farmer came, and he saw the campaign bus and everything. And, and he proceeded to get a tractor, and he just dug this huge pit. And he buried all these lawyers in there. He'd been involved in the accident, all 13 of them. And, you know, and then the next day, the sheriff shows up. And he said, yeah, I heard somebody drove by. And I said, it looked like that campaign bus that was missing you know, went off the road around here. And they said they didn't see any bodies, but they saw blood and stuff. And, and, and uh, it's right here by your, you know, you know what happened? He goes, yeah, I buried all 13 of them right there. It saved the, saved the town a lot of money. I just did it myself. He goes, wow. He goes, you buried them all. He goes, are, are, are you sure that they're all dead as you're throwing dirt on them? He goes, huh, yeah, they were all dead. He goes, a few of them were complaining, saying they were alive. But you know how lawyers are. They always lie. Or politicians are. They always lie. So I just kept burying them, you know. And, uh, and I, I, there's so many jokes like that. I thought, you know, it's funny. Why are there so many jokes about politicians and lawyers lying? It's because there's a lot of truth to that, that truth. Thank God. Thank God, amen, that there are, there are honest to goodness lawyers and there are honest, I believe, politicians out there who do seek to tell the truth. And they want to be, but, and they're actually a, a light because they're known for seeking to be, you know, truthful and have integrity. But by and large, it's hard to trust a lot of people in this world, especially at the highest echelons of society. And we need more Christian lawyers out there, amen, that speak the truth, uh, to be salt and light in this world. But we need to keep in mind the problem of lying isn't just among the community of, in, in the law community or in the political community. It's in every community. There's even liars who have entered into the church. The Bible talks about false prophets, false Christ, false brethren. There's pastors who will uh, lie and lie and lie and lie. Because they have agendas, you see. And it's not about the Lord Jesus Christ and his glory and speaking the truth. But it's about making a bigger church and, you know, uh, they're like used car salesmen. I mean, there's one guy they had on television, one of the most popular preachers on television for years. They found out that he had fake tear ducts put in his eyes, you know, to make it look like he was crying. I mean, that just blows me away. And it's heartbreaking. And among many people who claim to be Christians... Uh, profess to be Christians, they lie just like the devil, man. They lie just like the people out in the world. You couldn't tell the difference. But in, the true, in true Christianity, with those who really love Jesus, lying is not a characteristic that should be found among them. Amen? Because we're commanded in the Scripture not to lie, but to speak the truth in love. And when I think of how prevalent lying is, the, the sin, the crime of lying, one study uh, and it's hard, hard to uh, believe this study, but it said that the average person lies seven times an hour, you know. And I thought, no, that's got to be whacked out, you know. And another, uh, studies also say that 30, between 30 and 38 percent of the time people talk, they're engaging in, in at least one lie. Uh, college students lie in 50 percent of their conversations with their mothers. 10, 000, or some, sorry, 10 million people lie to the IRS each year. That one's real believable. 80% lie of people lie on their resumes. 70% of doctors supposedly lie to insurance companies. Okay? Uh, one statistic had 100% of dating couples surveyed lied to each other in about a third of their conversations. 20 to 30% of middle managers surveyed had written fraudulent internal reports. 95% of participating college students surveyed were willing to tell at least one lie to a potential employer to win a job. 41% had already done it by the time of the survey. Wow! That means 9 out of 10 college kids will say, hey, I would lie to get a job. And I'd be bummed out, man, if I hired someone who was a liar, you know, then they lied to get the job. I mean, that just undermines the whole, I mean, if they're willing, dealing with money, you can't trust them. If they're dealing with uh, people, you can't trust them. And to think that our country, our culture is made up of people, the majority of people who admit that they engage in lying is very, very heartbreaking. It reminds me of the days of Isaiah 
when he said he, do, he lives among a people with unclean lips. Yet at the same time, we recognize that, we have, that humans have a fallen nature. We are depraved. We are sinful. And, yet, and many, many people have not been born again, obviously. So lying is a, a predominant sin in our culture. And we can't expect to have a healthy culture, health, healthy country, healthy communities if people at every strata of our society are engaging in lying. Lying is a serious sin, and we need to recognize how serious it is, and we need to recognize how God hates it. We need to recognize how God hates it and how he wants us to be delivered from it. And even as I mentioned, I had a testimony from a lady about her son that just blessed my heart. Uh, I had another uh, a dad come up with his son afterwards after the first service, and he said, my son wants to say thank you, and he, it was about lying because they've been dealing with him on that subject. And, and we talked for a few minutes, and it blessed my heart because... He was trying to overcome that problem. That's something they were dealing with. And I'm, I'm happy to know that as we go through this series on the seven deadly sins, God is dealing with hearts in the fellowship. Amen? But it's those who will be able to say, hey, I need help in this area. God strengthen me. That will make progress. It's, the Bible says, he who conceals his sin will not prosper. If you conceal something God's convicting you about and you're not dealing with it, you're going to hurt yourself and others. I challenge you right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to come clean with who you are before God and seek healing at the throne of God. Amen? So you can prosper. So you can be blessed. So your life can be blessed. So others who you know around you, your family, your loved ones in Christ can be blessed. And so the, and the greater community around us can be blessed as we are salt and light. Amen? Everybody here has fallen short. Every single one of us has fallen short in all kinds of areas. And, and, it, and, and for you, your struggle may have been this very sin. And you need to say, God, please help me. And every one of us needs to constantly pray, God, help me to be a person who speaks the truth in love. Because everybody here will be tempted in various ways. It may be the most subtle ways where it's, it's like, well, that was a white lie because, you know, I, I, I didn't want to hurt so-and-so's feelings. You have to be careful about all these things. You have to be very, very careful. In fact, uh, it's hard at times. There are different types of lies. And there's a certain kind of lie where it's considered like a caring lie. Where someone, well, I'm caring for the other person. I don't want to hurt their feelings, you know. And it can be hard sometimes. You know, I mean, if the wife comes up to you and, does this make me look fat, you know. I mean, how do you answer that if it just doesn't look as good on her as the other outfit? Well, you try to say something like that. Okay, I mean, it's, it can be really, really hard, but you don't, you don't, you can be tactful. You don't have to say, you know what? Yeah, it does. You know, you look just like, you know, I don't know, and start going off about how you look like a tub of lard. Yeah, I'd get something else on. That would be wrong because the Bible says, speak the truth in love. Amen. So you want to speak the truth, but you want to do it in love. You don't want to say, oh, I'll do a lie, and, that, and I, that's how I could be caring. No, that's not. And the intent might be right, but you didn't think it through, and you weren't obeying God in it, you know? And my wife will ask me from time to time, does this make me look this way or that way? And I have to be honest, you know, and thank God my, my wife, I think, looks wonderful, you know? But if some, I have to say, well, some, you know, some things you wear, sometimes they might make you look bigger. So I'll say, you know what, I think that would look better on you, because I have to speak the truth, you know? And my wife will tell me the same thing sometimes. She'll say, you sure you want to eat? Another one, another helping of that, you know? You know, you're probably right, you know? So we have this deal where we just speak the truth to each other in love. You know, you, you just love each other and speak the truth. And, and, and people can be too sensitive, but, you, you know, people need to also get over it being about, all about us, you know? It's about, supposed to be about God, amen? But we should be sensitive. And, and you know my wife, she's pretty, pretty blatant, you know, as far as, I mean, she just speaks her mind. She speaks the truth and... and, and and you've known that for years. I don't know how long you've been at Blessed Hope, but if you've been here for years and years, and when the fellowship just you know, had started and it was new over 15 years ago now, we'd, you know, we used to have time to fellowship with everybody. The church was a lot smaller, you know, and, and uh, we'd be able to get together for dinners and stuff more often. And, and Lisa would do this over and over again. If you invite her over your house and you asked her how she liked, you know, a certain, let's say, you know, your certain part of the plate, certain entree or whatever, and you said, how do you like it? You know, she'd just tell you. But she, she was trying to be tactful. Anybody remember her famous word? 
Interesting. Do you like that? Yeah. Oh, well, it's interesting because she didn't want to lie. She's, uh, when I met her, she, you know, she's a brand new believer. And, you know, we, and we got in the word a lot. And I said, you know, and she, before she knew Jesus, you know, like all of us, she lived a life. We all lived lies and stuff, you know. She came to Jesus. I said, you know, you have to speak the truth. That's your, and that was her heart. And she, so it's interesting. You know, I thought that's good. That's, I said, praise God, I know her heart's to do what's right. So, you know, and I wanted to make sure I married a gal that wanted to do what's right. And, but at the same time, I'd drive home and say, you know, I don't know if you want to say interesting. Uh, you don't want to lie about it, but if they ask you about the corn, maybe you say, or the, you know, the corn meal or whatever it is, maybe you say, you know, you can say, this is interesting, but make sure you can say that, but make sure you say, you find something good on the plate. <laughs> say, this is really good over here. You want to try and encourage them too, you know, and uh, try to find, you know, ways to speak the truth and love, you know, and, uh, well, what if it's all interesting? I go, well, you know. <laughs> she didn't say that. I was playing around there, but I could, I've, I've waited for that one. It hasn't happened yet. So nobody's meals have been all interesting. She sounds something I think she likes. Uh, she's a finicky eater. So I'm just using that as an example. Is you need to try to find ways to speak the truth in love, even on little issues. Because Jesus said if you can't be faithful in small things, you won't be faithful in bigger things. You know what I'm saying? So we want to make sure that we just have a line that we don't lie. We could be sensitive, you know, and there's all kinds of ways we can encourage people by still speaking the truth. Sometimes you, if you say, well, this person, if I give any other answer other than a lie, they'll freak out. Well, then you just don't answer, you know, they just say, you know, I'd rather not say, you know, and, and they say, well, what if they keep, then they, then they get really, well, guess what? Then maybe God is dealing with that person. Okay. If that person's whole life is going to freak out whether or not you like something of theirs or whatever, then they need to grow. And maybe God's using you to confront them. Amen. You know, I try to be a patient guy and I try to, I speak the truth in love. And sometimes I am too patient, you know, with situations. And, and then my wife will say, man, you need to tell this person this, you know, and I'll say, you know, I'm praying, you know, see the right time or whatever. And God will work it out. But the, the thing is, is we all need to make sure when we speak, we speak the truth. Amen. And we speak the truth in love. And because God does hate lying and, and turn to the book of Acts chapter five. And it's we uh, on a midweek study, we looked at Acts chapter five recently for a, whole, a totally different reason than why I'm in it right now. Uh, we looked at how the Holy Spirit is God and how there's different sins against the Holy Spirit. And in this case, they were lying to the Holy Spirit. But I don't want to talk about the sin against or different sins against the Holy Spirit so much. That's not this study. I want to talk more about how God hates lying. And in chapter 5, it's kind of interesting because this is the church. And the church had, you know, got started not long before Acts chapter 5. Jesus called out disciples. He called out the ecclesia, the called out ones, a body of believers making up the church. And the church was meant to be strong and pure and holy and righteous. And, and the early church had its challenges. But in Acts chapter 2, you'll see it says that there was great unity and the church was holy. The early church, when it first started, it says they were all in one accord. That doesn't mean they were all in one Honda, but it does mean that they were all in unit. It's an old word we used to use more often. They're all unified, you know. The church was all one in Christ, and they were going forward. And the church had a lot of power in Christ. They were strong. It was very early. It was at, at, in Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 5, you're talking about a matter of days and weeks, you know, by the time you get through the early chapters of the book of Acts. And the church was strong. And Satan tried to destroy the church from the outside through persecution, he uses persecution to try to destroy the church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. Amen. That's why you don't have to become a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or some church that says, hey, we're the new church because the church stopped to cease to exist. And now God started it through me, Joseph Smith or whatever. Like Joseph Smith said, you know, all the creeds God told me were an abomination and all the ministers were corrupt. So he had me start the church over again because Satan prevailed against the church. No, Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will what? not prevail against it. Amen. The church has been around since Jesus started it. And those who love the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him belong to that church. And it's millions of believers around the world. However, Satan has tried many ways to try to deceive the church, to try to destroy it. And one of the main things he's tried to use through the years is persecution. Boom. An onslaught. Shedding blood. Causing people, telling people to denounce Christ or they lose their lives. And, and you know what? That's always pretty much backfired. Never really worked. In fact, where the church is persecuted the most often is where it's the strongest. One of the strongest places we see the church is in China. China is communistic. It's illegal to be a true, genuine Christian and be outspoken about the gospel and 
uh, share the gospel and spread out tracts. That's why it's underground. But did you know there's 100 million professing believers in China? The church is huge out there. It's underground for the most part, but it's huge. So Satan tries other means, and, and he's been more effective in destroying churches by coming from within than from without, by bringing false Christ and false prophets and false apostles and false brethren, you know, false scripture, you know, extra books that are put on par with the scripture, even higher in many cases. So we have to watch out. And that's what Satan tried to do here with Ananias and Sapphira. He tried to bring a cancer from within, and he inspired them to lie to the apostles. And there was such harmony prior to this time in the early church. And we read in chapter 5, verse 1, But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge, and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land, which it remained, while it remained unsold, did it not remain uh, your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your hearts? You have not lied to men, but to God. Now we've talked about a, the so-called carrying lies, these white lies where you're really caring for someone and how they're still not biblical. It's still a lie. And now we're talking about not just carrying lies, so-called carrying lies, but conceived lies. This was a conceived lie. He says, why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart and you have not lied to men, but to God? And keep in mind, who's at the heart of lying? Who is the first liar? Satan. And it says that Satan had inspired them. And you might think you've come up with this great lie, this great plan. Well, the greater your lie, the greater your deception, the more likely that Satan is the one who's feeding you the thoughts. I can tell you that right now. Because the Bible says the sons of the children of disobedience, children of disobedience are led led astray, it says, by the prince and the power of the air. When Judas came up to deceive and and lie about who he was to Jesus, when he went to to betray him, it says Satan entered into his heart, you see. Satan is very much inspiring. Demonic forces are inspiring lies. And now we move from a a so-called carrying lie to a conceived lie. You have not lied to men, but to God. Verse 5. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard it. The young men got up and covered him up. And after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And he said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in. And found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Verse 11. And great fear came upon the whole church. And over all who heard these things. You see, the fear of God. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is pure. You see, the fear of God. Knowing who God really is. And how the Bible says it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And the Bible says that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. When you recognize that God is a serious God. And he deals with sin. And he doesn't take it lightly. And the fear of God is upon you. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is to turn away from evil. And to hate evil. And to cling to God. So when you truly fear God, you don't want to do evil. You want to be right with God. And a big problem in the church today is there's no fear of God. People aren't taught the fear of God in many cases today. And we're not teaching the Bible. We're not teaching the true gospel. We're not teaching Jesus Christ in truth if we negate to preach the truth about the fear of God, about the judgment of God, about hell, about how God is a serious God and he's just. And so as you know, pastors need to preach the truth, and we as brothers and sisters of Christ need to stand up for truth because if there's no fear of God, then people do not, are not concerned about consequences of their sin. And this sin right here was so severe because the church, the sin was severe. You say, well, that's so, God was so like, wow, I mean, wow, boom, he just kills him. What's going on there? Man, I mean, why didn't he give, well, give him a chance. We'll check it out. Think about it, man. We all deserve to be dead right now. If we did not have the blood of Jesus, right? 
And God just enacted his judgment right now and didn't wait until judgment day. Boom, every one of us would follow were dead and need to be buried. Do you realize that? Because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says there's no one that goes through a day without a sin. Every one of us is guilty before God. So we all could just, this could happen to every one of us today. If God just said, hey. But what he was doing was he was using them as an example. Because the sin was already being corrupted from, the church was already being corrupted by sin from within. And the Lord had this great, he got the whole shot, you know, boom, we have whole shots when you just burst of energy and get out front. The Lord exploded the beginning of the church with miracles and signs and wonders to just get a lot of infusion of power to get, get the church going. And already Satan was challenging it because we see Satan inspired this. It says that. Why has Satan filled your heart? To lie to the Holy Spirit. He was trying to destroy the church from within. And God wanted to purify the church. He wants the church to be pure. And you know what? That's why he calls us to bring church discipline. The Bible says if your brother sins against you, go to him privately and confront him with his sin. And if you, he repents, you've won your brother. And I'm sure that's happened a lot of times at Blessed Open. We don't even, we don't, not even know it. A lot of people have confronted their brother or sister and things are great. Praise God. But it says if your brother refuses to repent, let's say somebody's, you know, they're getting drunk and they're going to these, you know, horrible bars with, watching, you know, dancing going on that's you know naked women stuff like that and the brother gets confronted and he doesn't repent then you bring one or two more you say hey this is not behavior that's becoming of a christian you need to turn it It will destroy your life it's not good for your relationship with your wife it's going to destroy your marriage and the guy still refuses to repent but he's still coming in the church well then you bring it before then you bring it even beyond that one and then those other two or three or one or two i'm sorry then you bring it before the, the church you go to leadership and say hey, this guy's going to our church but you know he's blatantly just you know getting drunk and he's you know He's not coke, and he's you know, involved in all kinds of sexual sin. Well, then we go to him and say, hey, please turn. Try to salvage the marriage and everything. But if they won't repent, and they refuse to repent, they say, hey, I'm going to come to the church, but you know what? I'm going to live my life the way I want. We say, hey, this is not the place for you then, man. Because the church is a call, a called out and called to be separate and holy. And God calls us for your own good to confront you, but you can't stay here if you're going to do that. And that brings purity to the church. And our fellowship has exercised Church discipline. I'm, I'm grateful to say in the, all the years we've been around, we've only had to go to the pulpit probably twice, two or three times over some issue like that where a person had refused to repent. You know, Sometimes somebody, they'll realize, wow, this church says you need to walk with God and they might leave after visiting for a week you know, or two. Or, or maybe they're here for a couple of years and they just want, they want to be involved in their sin you know, and they might say, hey, you know, but if someone's staying here and they want to be involved in something that's blatantly contrary to Scripture and... The evidence is there and they refuse to repent, you know. We gotta lovingly say, Hey, please turn for your own sake. Why won't you turn? And then if they don't, you know. But you know what? Sometimes you can't know what somebody's doing because these two people, and I said fiber, they had a scheme going by between the two of them, right? Nobody knew. <sighs> we got away with this plan. What a great plan. No, it came from the pit, it came from Satan, as we've seen. And they didn't get away with anything because guess what? In the eyes of Humans they may have, although Peter discerned by the Holy Spirit that they were lying. I believe God showed that to him. But there was, God didn't even, God bypassed church discipline. Boom. God just killed him right there. First Ananias, then he kills Sapphira. That's heavy stuff. Fear of God came upon the church. And what do you think happened? You think people were, were thinking about, you think anybody that was involved in any kind of lying in the church had second thoughts about it when they heard about Ananias and Sapphira? They went to that funeral. They're probably like, God, help me not to lie. And that's the way we need to be all the time. We need to recognize this is a living word of God recording a historical event that happened so God can show us how much he hates lying and how much lying, how lying is so destructive, you see. And it's important that we deal with truth issues. I mean, God forbid, I, you know what? I would not even, if I... I couldn't pass her. If somebody told me, hey, you can't talk about certain things. You, you, you don't want to you know, ruffle people's feathers. You don't want to convict somebody who's involved in sin that might be coming to your church. You don't want to preach against certain sins you know, because you want the church to get really, really big. I'd say, well, then that's your church getting really, really big because it's not his church. You know, because his church is run his way and whoever preaches for his church speaks his truth off the page. Amen? And that's what this church needs to be about is the truth. And... You know what? I'd much rather be around, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, 350, 400 people or so that, that want truth than 50,000 people who want to call church church 
but don't want truth and are there for, you know, the social reasons or what have you. Amen? And I, and I found, too, that, you know what? The Bible says speak the truth and there will be honor. I found out that when you speak the truth, guess what? People appreciate that. Do you know that? People, people that love truth, that want truth, appreciate the truth being told. Amen? And you'll find that out, too, as you deal in life. You speak the truth. And I'm not talking about arrogantly. I'm not talking about just using the truth to crush people. Uh, to, you know, wow, you sure have warts on your forehead. See, I'm a truthful person. They're going to honor me now. You know what? Speaking the truth in love, okay? And I'm talking about being a truthful, honest person, but speaking sincerely in love. And here, what was the problem? Was this communism? No. You see, what had happened, there were people sharing with each other But what happened in the early chapters of the book of Acts, people came from all over the place. Jews came from all these different countries and regions to the day of Pentecost. Foreigners that were Jews that were in other lands. And they came to the day of Pentecost because three times a year in Israel, you would go to Jerusalem to to celebrate three different holidays. And all the men would come and sometimes they'd bring family members and what have you. They'd bring their sons and sometimes they'd bring the whole family. But usually the men, you know, the men were required to come. So you had people from all these different areas that came to celebrate the day of Pentecost. And God chose this time because it was the Feast of Harvest, which was a picture of the harvest of the church and God bringing in the first fruits. And all of a sudden, all these people come and the gospel is being shared with them. And they're hearing the gospel in their own language as God used uh, the gift of tongues to the, the, the disciples there. And, and, and boom, people were astonished. But then Peter stopped when they said, man, these people are drinking. They're all speaking in different languages. And then Peter gave a powerful message and all kinds of people came to faith. In fact, if you read chapter 2 and chapter 3, you'll see a few thousand, you'll see even more come. In chapter 4, there was huge revival taking place. A lot of people coming to Christ. And guess what? A lot of these people that live far away, now they found out who the Messiah is. They're saying, wow, here in Isaiah 53, it says this would happen to the Messiah. And it's happened in our time. And they were blown away. So all kinds of people came to Christ. It was an exciting time. And they decided to live there. Well, why would we live? Why would we live anywhere else? We're with all our brothers and sisters in Christ. We came to know the Messiah. Let's stay here. So many people began to live in Jerusalem. And guess what? The jobs, there weren't thousands of jobs, though. There wasn't all the money available and food and and resources and homes for everybody to just get plugged in and just pick up life. So there was a stress upon the church to feed everybody. So what happened is people began to sell tracts of land. They began to sell homes and stuff that they had to meet the needs of the new converts who had come from the different regions who wanted to stay there and try to help out. I'm trying to give you the context of what happened here in Acts 5 so you understand some of the motivation because we moved from caring lives, which really aren't caring, okay, to uh, other kinds of lies, conceived lies, where they're calculated, calculated or conceived lies, to conceited lies. It was based on conceit and pride that Ananias and Sapphira fell into this sin. Because if you back up to chapter 4, let's look at the context. There was a lot of need, but guess what? There wasn't a needy person. Why? Verse 34. For there was not a needy person, chapter 4, verse 34. There was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales. You see? They were taking care of the needs of the disciples and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each at every, uh, as any had need. Now Joseph, a Levite or, uh, of uh, Cyprian birth, uh, who had also, was also called Barnabas, we always say his name was Joseph, but his nickname was Barnabas. He was called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement. He was an encouraging brother. It says, and who owned a what? Track of land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So what's happening right before chapter 5? You see this man Barnabas, he comes up and, you know, he sells a track of land, he puts it before the money from the, in front of the apostles' feet. And that would, can you imagine you're in need, there's a lot of need in church, and somebody sells a whole track of land and they give it to the poor? That would be a beautiful thing. And, that, and people have been doing that. It mentions this happening But in chapter 5, verse 1, the first word there is the word but. But's a conjunction. It's showing a contrast. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. You see what's going on here? Is how would people look at Barnabas for doing what he did? They would be, praise God. 
they would just be so thankful and it would be such, it, there would be such praise, praise God. That, I mean, I know I'd be going out and saying, praise God for Brother Barnabas, you know? What, a, what an encouraging brother, man. He just sold the whole track of land and gave to the church. And there'd be excitement about that because you see poor people that have nothing that have become believers and now they're being helped. And you're seeing the spirit of Christ and of grace be manifested through a sweet brother's heart, you know? And you, like, you say, wow, that's awesome. That's great. Well, guess what? Ananias and Sapphira witnessed the adulation, the praise that was being spoken of regarding Barnabas. And guess what they wanted? They wanted to be praised. They sold some land as well. Now, keep in mind, it, it's not communism. It's more like communalism. In communism, you're forced by the government, you know, to, you're, to, to, they steal your money and give it to other people who aren't working. If you make $250,000, you know, or two hundred twenty-five, or whatever it is, we're going to take your money and give it to the poor, you see. And, you know, socialism or communism or whatever. And what's interesting is this was strictly by what? It was strictly voluntary. You didn't even have to... He says when the land was yours, you know, you had it in your power. I mean, you didn't have to sell that land to give any of it to the poor, Peter's saying. It's, it, the money was yours. But the problem was Ananias and Sapphira pretended that they were giving, that they sold this land and they were taking every penny and giving it to the church. They were being what the word is, hypocrite. They were being hypocrites. They were pretending to be somebody they weren't. And hypocrisy has hurt the church of Jesus Christ more than persecution. It's hurt the witness of Jesus Christ more than persecution. And we need to make sure, here at Blessed Hope Chapel, all believers need to make sure that we are sincere people. One of my favorite verses in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 5, it says, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart. Right? It says a clean conscience. And it says a sincere faith. I love that verse. In 1 Timothy 1, 5, the goal of our instruction, it says, is love from a pure heart. That we're loving people from a pure heart. We're loving God from a pure heart. And it says, and a sincere faith. A faith that's sincere, where you're sincere about your faith. And a clean conscience. See, now, if you are loving God and a people with a pure heart, and you have a sincere faith, you will have a what? Good conscience. And I love that verse because it says, the goal of our instruction. This is the goal of everything Paul is preaching, is that we'd have pure hearts purified by God, a sincere faith, and clean consciences. And I hope to God that that's what you strive for. And that's why I wanted to go through the seven deadly sins, so God could purify our hearts, so God could, would make sure we have sincere faith, so we could have clean consciences. You know, it's not popular to talk about sin anymore in the church, but every page of Scripture, just about, of the entire Bible, is God's rage against sin and how evil it is, because sin breaks the law of love and brings destruction. That's why God hates sin, because it destroys His creation. You see, because he's a good God. That's why he hates sin. Not because he's mean, but because he's good. And lying is very, very destructive. And here at Nice Fiber, they didn't have to give the money for the land. But when they did, they shouldn't have said, we're giving, oh, we sold the whole land and here's every penny of it. Look, we just love the church so much. It's good that we love the Lord. It's good that you love his bride, the church. I hope you love the church. I hope your hearts to be a blessing to your brothers and sisters in Christ. But don't be hypocrite. Don't be a liar. Don't do that because you say, wow, I've done it before. He didn't kill me. Maybe God didn't see me do it. God saw you, man. He saw it before you even created what you were going to do. The Bible says some people's, it says in Timothy, some people's sins are dealt with immediately by God in this life. Others are dealt with after they die, it says. God's sovereign. And if you weren't wiped out because of some serious sinning, Thank God that you weren't and say, God, have mercy on me because it says God gives space to repent. Even Jezebel, in the book of Revelation chapter 2, the Lord Jesus says that she, she commits fornication or she teaches my servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to, to idols. But I've given her space to repent. I've given her space to repent. And that trips me out. That verse trips me out because this lady's like a false prophetess. And I'm like, wow, God gave this lady space to repent. That's how merciful he was. It'd be hard for me to give space 
If I found out there was a woman teaching people to have sexual fornication in our church and, and eat things, you know, uh, or can be involved in a sacrificial worship to idols, I wouldn't waste any time. I mean, I'd say, God, help me have wisdom to do it. But I'd say, there's the door, you know. I would sit down with her. You know, I'd want to have the, the, the patience of Christ. Jesus is patient, though, is what I'm saying. And I would strive to be patient like he is because that would be so horrifying. But look, at he was even patient with her. And what I'm saying is, God doesn't always wipe two people out like that. But I also believe that God was patient with Ananias and Sapphira. I believe the Holy Spirit was checking them, was saying, no, don't do this. And they were lying to the Holy Spirit, you see. And I don't believe it just happened in a few moments. I believe this was a process. And you may be involved in something, God's speaking to you right now, saying you need to turn from it. It's very, very serious. You need to turn and God's giving you space. But there'll be a time where that time is up. Because then God said Jezebel's time was up. He had given her space to repent, but now he says, I'm going to cast her and her children into a bed of sickness. You know, And then everybody will know, he says, that he's the Lord of the churches. I'm kind of paraphrasing what he says. He goes, then everybody, that people will know who I am. Just like God, everybody knew who he was here, right? It, the church feared. They feared God again. And the news of those who heard it, the news, they feared. And in Revelation, when he deals with Jezebel, he says, you'll know. You'll know. See, God wants his reputation as being holy to be maintained in the church. And I'd rather preach the holiness of God and have us live according to his holiness rather than to not preach it and us not live that way and have God have to wipe people out or things to happen to us for God to get our attention. Amen? You agree with that? Because it even says in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that some people, when they were getting together at the church of Corinth to break bread and to take communion, that some of them were drinking too much wine. You see, they'd mix wine, water with wine to kill the bacteria. He said, some of you are getting drunk at the Lord's feast. And he talked about how others were being rude. They weren't sharing their food with anybody. People come that were poor and they wouldn't give them any food. And, and Paul said, that's why there's some sick and some even dying among you. Isn't that heavy? Some are even dying among you because God's disciplining you because he would rather have you be disciplined so you could repent and get right with God than to be condemned with the world. God will bring things in the church to wake the church up. And that's why the Bible says judgment begins at the house of God because God wants to get our attention. Everything, the judgment's going to start with the house of God. We want to make sure we're right with God. So this sin, though, I believe, was inspired by pride because Ananias and Sapphira saw what was going on. And Now, I don't know if they said, hey, let's do this so we can get praise, or they said, let's do this, but then, oh, but you know what? Let's keep some back, but let's not tell them because we don't want to look bad because look, Barnabas gave everything. I don't know exactly what, what their thinking was. It doesn't tell us, but we do know that this but a man, it's contrasted with Barnabas. And it's in the context of them seeing others give. And we need to make sure that when we give, we do it out of humility. And, I, and I, you know what? I'm, I'm happy to say there have been people that have been such a blessing. Everybody that's given has been such a blessing. But there's, there's people that sometimes where they could be quite noted in their giving because they've blessed the, the, the church in so many ways, I mean, financially, but have never come and said, hey, can you let people know what I've done? Or can you have my name on this building? Uh, we've got the church. We purchased the land for the church, $425,000. We've had to pay, we paid it off, what, a few years ago, right? And oh, by the way, that ended up being a great investment. If that land doubled, right, and was 950000 would you agree that would be a great investment? Well, now we had to pray. Well, so they, people that bought the land next to us wanted to buy our land. And this was just eight months ago when we had the meeting when this financial crunch had just begun. And they were offering us, oh, about two and a half million. So I went mean, quadrupled and beyond that in price. So God, God's been gracious to us, and he's protected us because if we end up in a situation and the economy continues to go down, uh, there's something that the church has uh, to, to lean on financially. That, uh, so if God so deems it, I mean, we lean on the Lord ultimately, but he provides for his own, amen? So I'm grateful to say that's an exciting thing. But it's interesting, people that have given, I've never had anybody come up to me and say, hey, Joe, can you, can you broadcast what I've done? I've had people come up that have helped the church in a lot of ways and pleaded with me, please do not say where this came from. Please, don't, I, don't, I don't want you to say a word. And then called me up later, hey, don't say a word, okay? And wow, that's humility, you know? 
That's humility. Because Jesus said, when you give, don't blast a trumpet. You know? And they literally had little trumpets. Did you know that? The Pharisees? They all had little trumpets. They'd let people know they were giving. That's not just a uh, metaphor, you know? I'm sure it's used metaphorically in the context of don't be like that, but quite incredible. So we have to watch our hearts. We need to examine our hearts when it comes to the way we speak and the things we say and why do we say them. Are we seeking truth? Are we saying things because we fear men? The Bible says the fear of man is a snare, right? Or do we say things because we fear God? You need to make sure when you're talking to other people that you are conscientious, first and foremost, of God's presence. Amen? And that he is the one that matters. Because Jesus is the one that said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, that every idle word that's spoken will come up at the day of judgment. What I say to humans, you know, ultimately what I say to humans before God is what matters. And you better be way more concerned about what you say to humans before God than to humans before humans. So what I seek, and I hope we all seek this, is I always pray. Uh, one, of my, one of the prayers I pray the most, I pray it probably, I don't know how, I pray it all the time. Father, help me speak the truth in love. Especially when I come up, before I come to preach, I might pray that prayer as part of my other prayers over and over again. Father, help me to speak the truth in love. Help me to speak the truth in love. Because I would never, ever want to compromise his word. And I never want to be uh, hateful or anything like that. That's not my heart. But you have to watch your heart. So I say, help me speak the truth in love. And that's the way we need to communicate with one another. If you're in a marriage, you know how many problems would go away in a, in a marriage if you simply spoke the truth in love? Did you realize, do you realize that? If you spoke the truth in love to your partner and you didn't become arrogant, obnoxious, and mean-spirited and hateful, you'd be such a blessing. you have such a blessed relationship if you speak the truth in love. And you seek to put the other person before yourself. You'll be a lot more blessed, believe me. So there's a great lesson right there in chapter uh, 5. I mean, can you imagine being at that church? Can you imagine two people walking in, right? Say, hey, Joe, I want to interrupt the sermon. Just want to let you know, we just put in the first service before everybody else got here a check for $100,000 of the church. Oh, everybody else is still here. Oh, hi, guys. And they left, right? And as they're leaving, we hear this, <coughs> two thuds. You know, and I mean, we wouldn't bury him outside. I mean, it'd be like, that would be sad. And you'd be like, whoa, man. And, but I, I used to wonder how come there's so many, as you drive through the country and stuff, you, there's so many cemeteries right next to churches. You ever notice that? Uh, maybe it happens more than I thought, you know? So I don't think that's the reason. But we need to make sure that we recognize that God is a serious God. You know, he calls us to uh, be humble. There's all kinds of different lies. And I think... Uh, one of the things we need to watch out for is also not just so-called caring lies. We need to watch out for conceited lies, ones that are motivated by conceit. We have to watch out for cruel lies. Cruel lies are where people break one of the Ten Commandments, which says you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. When someone bears false witness against their neighbor for to be cruel. Now, that's not always the motivation. Someone bears false witness against their neighbor, but sometimes it's because someone wants to exalt themselves. You know, and they, they, they say, this person is this and that and the other, and, and they may start making things up. You want to make sure you never do that because that's one of the Ten Commandments, man, not to uh, be cruel to people, not to bear false witness against others. There's all other kinds of lies, for instance, cowardly lies. Cowardly lies are lies whereby people seek to avoid consequences. They don't want to go get in trouble. They... You know, it depends what is, is, you know, or, or, you know, with the Monica Lewinsky thing years ago, or you have people trying to avoid consequences. So these are, these are lies uh, that are cowardly lies. You don't want to look a certain way, or you don't want the consequence, and, and that'll often motivate people to lies. In fact, when God confronted Adam with his sin, he shifted the blame to Eve and said, it was a woman that you gave me, you know. He blame shifted, you know. And then when he confronted Eve, he says, it's the serpent, you know, the serpent deceived me. He, she blame shifted. So a lot of people will blame shift or they'll point to something else because they don't want to go through the consequences. Make sure you're not, that's not the motivation. And the reason I'm talking about motivations and not just lies, the reason I'm talking about the motivations is because we need to search our hearts, you guys. We need to say, okay, is there an area where I lie? 
Is it maybe I don't want to hurt someone's feelings? Is it maybe uh, because I want to look good? Is it maybe because I want praise like anti sapphire Is it maybe because I don't want to be grounded if I'm a young person or get in trouble? And all these things will just, all they'll do is uh, get you more and more in trouble. And a lot of times people give these cowardly lies because they're insecure and they don't want to look a certain way. But I think it's so important, I really do, I think it's so important that you right now look at your heart, and we all do, and we say, okay, is there an area where I'm not being truthful, or where I'm prone to lying, and why is it? Examine our hearts. When I was talking to a young guy in between services with his dad, and we explored that, you know, because he's saying, I don't know why I do it all the time, because it was such a habit for him, and they've been confronting that recently. So after the first service, he brought him up. We tried to explore, you know, why, you know, and what's going on there, and, and we need to recognize and I try to tell him, I go, look, has it really blessed your life to be lying? And it doesn't. It just causes shame and sadness and pain. That's the irony of the whole thing. He said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen? Salvifically first, but also in areas of our lives, from chains that hold us down. So we want to we examine our lives and make sure we're walking in the truth. Look at Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. And when you get there, Proverbs chapter 28, uh, let's look at verse uh, 23, Proverbs 28, verse 23. He who rebukes a man will afterward find more favor than he who flatters with the tongue. Some people will flatter with their tongue to win favor with people and not want to tell them the truth. And they think, oh, I've scored points because I've flattered with my tongue. But notice what it says in the first part of that verse. He who rebukes a man will afterward find what? You'll find more favor. If you, re- if you speak the truth in love, you'll have more favor with people than if you speak flattering and lies. Now, you might have the world's favor in some way, but it's not real favor that's going to bless you in the end. It's going to come up and bite you later. So... It's important that we understand how serious all of this is. Look at Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs 11, verse 1. A false balance, these are scales, is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. When pride comes, then comes dishonor, but with the humble is wisdom. The integrity of the upright will guide them, but the crookedness of the treacherous will what? Destroy them. Your lying will destroy you. The crookedness of the treacherous will destroy them. The very lies that people build their lives upon, whereby they think they're getting ahead and they're making points, will actually destroy them in the long run. So it's imperative that we, we recognize that all things will be brought into judgment, even if you get away with things, so to speak, in this world. Your sin will find you out. You will stand before God. Every idle word will go before the Lord. And if you have not truly sought the Lord, but you've lived a lie, you're in trouble. Huge trouble. You're, and I cannot plead with you enough. If you are one of those people, and, and I'm sure there's got to be, I mean, first, second service, two service, there's got to be more than just one kid who's struggling with that. And, and I'm not talking about just struggling. If you're struggling with it, grow by the means that we're talking about. But if you're coming here and you are living a lie, your whole life is a lie, and you're pretending to be a Christian, and you're going to Blessed Hope Chapel, and you think that, hey, you're the one person that can get away with just being living a lie, first of all, know that you're not getting away with it. Just like Ananias and Sapphira, God has you totally pegged. He knows exactly what you're doing. And I would encourage you right now to fall on your face before God and repent and say, God, have mercy on me. I have blown it. I have played the hypocrite. I have not been who I'm claiming to be, I need to get right with you right now. And if you truly in your heart cry out to God and say, God, have mercy on me. Forgive me. He'll forgive you if you truly, sincerely confess your sins. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of some, most, or all. And cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Anything you've done has been nailed to the cross. If you truly repent, you'll be forgiven of it. And then if you ask the Lord to change your heart, he will. But if you're coming, you're saying, man, I'm not even really a Christian. I'm not following Christ. I've been just living a whole lie, pretending. You need to turn right now because the Bible says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, that, you know, 
It says the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, not just some. You say, well, I'm not a liar, I'm a Christian. Well, I'm a Christian that lies a lot. I'm not one of those, I'm not on that list. No, it doesn't say some liars. It says all liars. And there's no such thing as a Christian liar. Did you know that? There's no such thing as a Christian liar. Because that's an oxymoron. Uh, Jesus is the way, that truth, and life. A Christian is one who follows Jesus. Amen? And you can't be following Jesus if you're living a bunch of lies. So you need to repent and get right with the Lord. If you haven't got, if you're saying, you know what, Joe, I know what you're saying, but hey, that's not my intent. I don't want to get right with God. I'm here for the wrong reasons, and I'm, I'm a liar, and I don't intend to repent. Well, then I ask you nicely, please leave. Don't stay in this fellowship, because this fellowship is not for you. This fellowship is about following Jesus Christ with sincerity and truth for people that want to know the Lord God and want to live for him and honor him and glorify him. Amen? And I say with all sincerity in my heart, please stop coming here. If you're intent, not if you're struggling, you're saying, I'm trying to get right with God, you're welcome here, right? But if you have the intent of deceiving people and, you have, and you're here for the wrong reasons with the wrong motives and you don't want to repent and you're just disagreeing with everything I'm saying, why are you here? Please, please, I say this nicely, I love you, but it's not good for us and it's not good for you. And God's going to come down on you hard if you stick around and you refuse to repent. Okay, I'm just, I've got to speak the truth. Because God wants our fellowship to be pure and be right. You say, well, nobody's perfect. Yeah, nobody's perfect. But everybody here, and not the pastor, nobody here is close to perfect. But everybody here that's truly a believer is seeking to be perfect. Is seeking to be like Jesus. And Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. We're seeking to grow. And that's what it's about here. And I'd rather have a fellowship filled with people who are sincere, amen, that want to grow in the Lord, than that filled with people who are not and I read about a little boy, you know, and he wanted to get changed. Or he didn't want to get changed. His mom wanted him to get changed because this little boy was one of those. Do you ever meet a kid in elementary school? And he would just, he knew everybody and he had all these stories. And well, this little boy, I mean, he was always lying about who he was. And he talked about how he knew Bigfoot, you know, and was very close to Bigfoot. And that he was the only one that had a relationship with Bigfoot because he knew Bigfoot in the entire family. And then when the right time came about, he was going to, be able to reveal all his pictures of Bigfoot. And his friends were all excited. They'd come over and listen to his Bigfoot stories. Then his mom heard him talking about how he was caught up by a spaceship and met, met these green men from you know, Pluto and, and how uh, he was, really had a great rapport with them. And she just was tired of it. And she kept talking to him. He'd never change. He'd just get worse. And she called the pastor. And she said, Pastor, you know what? My son really needs to be cured. I want you to talk to him about his line. He just constantly has all these stories. The pastor said, bring him over. They sat down and she, they had this talk and the pastor decided to use reverse psychology. He said, this will cure the boy. And I'll say, I'll just tell him this outlandish lie and see what he thinks of me. And he said, son, you know what? I had a men's retreat up in the mountains, and it was a great men's retreat, and there were you know, hundreds of men there. And, and all of a sudden, a grizzly bear came up and just started munching on one man and ate a whole. Every part of him was eaten like a cookie. And he went, proceeded from one man to the next. And after he got done with eating 300 men, ate every one of them. He got so big. You know, he's a couple hundred feet tall now because he's eaten all these men. He came with me. He was going to eat me. And this little dog, five inches, comes up and just devours the whole grizzly bear. Son, do you believe that? Son says, sure, I believe that. That was my dog, you know. <laughs> and, and some people, it seems like they just will not get cured. You know, that they'll never learn. And I'll tell you what, reverse psychology is not going to change the heart. No human technique is going to bring the cure. The cure only happens by the Lord Jesus Christ. You must be born again, Jesus said, to enter the kingdom of God. We need a change of heart, amen? Because the Bible says a leopard can't change its spots. God is the only one who can change us fundamentally from within. And the scriptures tell us in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 14, it says, outside, it's talking about the holy city of New Jerusalem, are the dogs, are the uh, sexually immoral, are the, those who are practicing or doing pharmakeia, and the, all these, gives a list of all these people. And it says, and everyone who loves and practices lying. That's verse 15. Verses 14 and 15. Everyone who practices lying. Because he told that little boy, he said, son, you know liars don't go to heaven? If you've told lies, you're not going to heaven. And he says, 
Pastor, you think my mom and dad ever told a lie? Pastor said, yeah. He goes, Pastor, have you ever, ever told a lie in your life? Pastor said, yeah. He said, well, then I think the only ones going to heaven are, the only ones in heaven are God and George Washington, where none of us are going there. And then when you think about it, it's like, wow, if anybody's ever come short of God's glory isn't going to heaven, he'd be right. But the key there is those who love and practice lying. It's your way of life, and you haven't repented of it. And that's why in verses 14 and 15, the last chapter of the Bible, it talks about those who have washed their robes, right, will go into the holy city. What does it mean to wash your robes? In Revelation chapter 7, it talks about this great multitude that no man can number, made up of every people from every nation and kindred and tongue who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. That means the stains of sin that we have, unless we're cleansed from those stains of sin, and they're taken away through Christ's death, when he died 2,000 years ago on a cross, paying for those sins, if we don't accept what he did on the cross and turn to him as a Lord and Savior and ask for repentance, we'll never be forgiven of our sins. We have two huge problems as human beings. Number one, we're guilty of sin. Number two, we have a sinful nature. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the great news that we have in Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, The good news is that both of those problems, the worst problems humanity has, are cured in Jesus. First, we're cleansed by the blood of Jesus from the penalty of our sins because of his death. Amen? And as we're cleansed and God comes into our hearts, the Holy Spirit changes our hearts. Amen? We're given new hearts. And he makes us new and gives us a desire to do what's right, a desire to please him. See, before you knew the Lord Jesus, you you didn't have this strong, overwhelming desire just to be right with God and, and please him and even to want to speak the truth. But because of Jesus Christ, he's changed our hearts, amen? That's evidence that you're born again if you want to be a truthful person and you're seeking Jesus. So praise God for the good news. We had uh, a man come here and speak here. Uh, it was, we had chairs from back, all the way packed to the end. It was packed house. It was great to hear him speak. And he was uh, ex-Muslim, ex-sniper, as many of you heard his speech for the PLO, for Yasser Arafat, who he drove around. And he gave a testimony at my house. We have him on videotape and interviewing him. And he said, you know what? As a Christian, he goes, things change. Because as a Muslim, he said, all the Muslims I knew, we all lied all the time. It was just part of our lives. And in Islam, you're taught to lie to encourage, uh, uh, to spread Islam. Many of them are. And he said, when I became a Christian, he said it was very hard. Because when I was a new Christian, it was so habitual for me to just lie. And then I had to discipline myself, put my hand over my mouth and say, I can't do that. And it took time. Well, in the book of Colossians, the book of Ephesians, it talks about how God gives us a new heart. And that with that new heart, it says to put off speaking lies and to start speaking the truth. Amen? So it's a process of growth. You may say, I've been born again, but I slipped back there or I did this. Guess what? If you truly love Jesus, right? And you're going forward and you're saying, I'm not practicing lying. That's not my heart anymore. You're seeking to go forward, Right? Even if you've fallen short, you can be cleansed, amen? The key is to get back up and go forward and determine your heart to be a truthful person and not practice lying, amen? Praise God. If you're here and you're saying, Joe, you know what? I so much want to know God and I so much want to do what's right and I've been visiting and I'm that guy you're talking about or that gal you're talking about and I've never tried to follow Jesus. I've just been a hypocrite just visiting, coming for some time and wanting to sell something I'm not. Well, I ask you right now to bow your heart Uh, with me and ask Jesus Christ into your life and let's all bow our hearts and seek the Lord together Father I pray with anybody who's saying and maybe that's not their big problem it's another one but they don't know you Lord just ask Jesus right now say Jesus forgive me of my sins I am so sorry I've sinned against you and Father in heaven I come to you in the name of your son Jesus and ask you to forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness I love you and I want to follow you. Forgive me for lying. Forgive me for all the sins I've committed. I want to be cleansed. I want my robe cleansed by the blood of Jesus. I want my heart changed by the power of your spirit. I want you, Father, and your Son to live in my heart and your spirit. Come into me now. Jesus said, whoever comes to him, he's not going to cast away. He promised that. All you do is come to him right now. He'll receive you. He sees you. He loves you. He died to save you, and he's yearning for you to come to him and know him. Say, Lord God, have mercy on me, and he will have mercy on you. And Father, I pray for all the believers here. Lord, help us to speak the truth in love. 
Help us to be kind to one another. Help us help your truth to be written on our hearts, inscribed in our hearts, and, and, and love and kindness and truth to be bound around our necks, Lord. May we walk truth, live truth, and walk in love and live in love.